yeah, there are people out there that will always try to chance their arm and really try to ramp up and squeeze every last bit out of you. But ultimately, the experience that you can deliver is being diluted. If you're trying to work out if it's friend or foe, if someone's new, you know, you just go, right, what, what's he do? What's he done? What's he about? Okay, boom, box, boxed him off. Yeah, he's Nick and Marie. Nick saw an awful lot of uh, action in Afghanistan, four tours of Afghanistan. What you're looking at there is the result of World War One, World War Two. Nick, how are you, brother? Hi, Chris. Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me back. Friends at home, I'm absolutely delighted to have Nick Goldsmith back on the show. Uh, fellow Royal Marines Commando. Nick saw an awful lot of uh, action in Afghanistan, four tours of Afghanistan, following which surfaced a, a lot of trauma. And Nick worked through it by getting into the great outdoors, hence why I believe it's called the great outdoors. <laughs> Nick founded Hidden Valley Bushcraft, and they have a particular program, the Wounded, uh, the Woodland Warrior Program, uh, aimed to help struggling forces people or vet veterans. Um, and also, I believe someone's just got a book out, Nick, and I believe that book is called Rewild Your Mind. There we go. Look, straight in with a plug. Filthy, filthy book plug. Thank you for that, Chris. Yeah. It's very <laughs> No, it's, uh, mate, having written a few books in my time, it's one hell of an achievement. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. Uh, I mean, I'd never thought in a thousand years that I'd be um, somebody who would write a book, to be honest. Um, it wasn't on the list, on the top of my, my agenda at the time. In fact, the top of my agenda was just spending time in the outdoors, doing more of what works and less of what didn't because of the way I was feeling at the time. Obviously, as times change, that organically led into starting Hidden Valley Bushcraft, which led to the Woodland Warrior Programme. And here we are at a book. And what's the reception been like? So you've got the hardback out and the Kindle, which is generally what publishers uh, do. Yep. How's so, the reception uh, been? It's fantastic. I've, I've all, all credit to um, Welbeck. So this is uh, published by Welbeck. And um, I was very fortunate to get a foreword from, from Foxy, Mr. Jason Fox, which has, I suspect, greatly aided things. It went to uh, a bestseller status on Amazon within the first 24 hours of it going out. So we managed to get that that little accolade that everybody so badly wants to get. We managed to get that in, in a couple of different uh, genres. Um, uh, it's probably not there anymore, but it got there. So I, I'm, I'm super, super pleased. The overall feedback has been nothing short of incredible and it exactly reaffirms to myself why I spent so long tucked away in a little coffee shop, scribbling away in a little leather bound book, much like this one. Um, uh, and then, and then getting that all typed up and, um, what are they called? transcribed, transcribed, been learning big words. Uh, and then, and then kind of, you know, trying to get that put into sections, which unlike, and like a, a sort of book, you, you, you may imagine someone writes a book and you have to give an element of your life story. So in the first 13 pages of this book, um, there is the trials and tribulations and trauma essentially in there, the gritty reading. But this is a self-help book. This isn't, a, you know, there's no picture of me on the front here. This is a sort of a hopefully a timeless book that people can use for years to come. So, you, well, quite literally, I'll read off the uh, Use nature as your guide to a healthier and happier life. So the whole thing is set out and aimed at, I guess, if someone's living in a 20-story tower block in London, this still has massive relevance to you. And you should be able to sit down, typically if you're a bloke on the toilet, on any page, open up that page and put, put into play readily whatever's on that page. That was my challenge. 
Um, it's broken into three sections. So the first bit is purely to contextualize where I was at and how I arrived at that point that I felt so low um, and didn't want to be here anymore. And then what that turnaround, how that took place, what did I do about it or what was happening as a byproduct of me spending time in the right environment. Using that analogy, you don't put a poorly fish in dirty water, put it in the cleanest environment that it can be in. Yes. It's an analogy I, funnily enough, I use a lot for um, diet, teaching people. I haven't got my pH strips hand. Oh, there they are. Teaching people that your body has a pH level just like a fish tank. And if you yeah. pollute it with toxic, used to, we used to call it Western diet, but now it's just global diet. Everybody eating this abundance of unnatural carbs and huge amounts of animal proteins and then right. wonder, wondering why we're sick like <laughs> all the time all the and, and uh it's you really <laughs> nick it's just really hard for me because i see people that i really love or i've developed a relationship with over the internet that you know they big up everything i do and i and and, and they're very you know people come become very special to you don't they and then i see them in the next one they've got like the big c or they're having they're struggling and it's like no one has ever sat them down and talked about the basics of health. Like we, like we just said, the fish tank, you know, your body, if, if, if you pollute the environment, you, you are going to get sick. And there was, there was a time in the nineties where talking about diet, it, it started to surface and people, it, it was a lot of bullshit. It was like eat whole grain bread as if, eating any like abundance of unnatural carbs can be good for you, but at least people were discussing it. Then they had this five a day veg and fruit. I call it nonsense because they include like uh, strawberries in syrup. <laughs> it's literally about 80 spoons of sugar in a can of strawberries in anyway, um, I digress, but there's a lot of conversations that we're not having as a species and of course another big one is why why have we got this so spectacularly wrong why do we live in a concrete jungle that's making everybody desperately unhappy and yet the second like i had the absolute pleasure of doing last weekend uh with nige kerno from forest roots adventures folks if you want to get in touch with nige it's up there in St staffordshire my point, uh, Nick, is like we went in the nature. As always, we braved the rain. So it, most people would have gone, nah, not, 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 not doing it. But we just whacked up a tarp so we could have our fire underneath cooking. So, so this is your mates have gone to Dartmoor and you've gone and. Yeah, this was a, 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 a subscriber, a watcher of the podcast that contacted me when he saw me try and make fire by friction. And oh, yeah. You were saying about yeah, that. and spectacularly fail. Dear oh. Nige drove all the way down from up north. And we went out to, to uh, uh, shall we say, a, a secret place on Dartmoor and um, where we were able to have a, a, a fire. And, okay. uh, and he taught me fire by friction and I did it like with proper guidance first go. But he said one thing, Nick. He said, Chris, when people come out here with me on my bushcraft courses, they say, wow, life is just so great when you're in the nature. It is. And, and, and he has to say to him, no, this is the normal. This is how life should be. It's, it's <laughs> the living in the concrete jungle and doing the nine to five. That, that's the, you know, that's the, like the unnatural but i don't know if i just made sense there nige puts it a lot more eloquently i think there's many ways to skin a cat and does it feel right to you first and foremost if it feels right do more rock works unless of what doesn't we, we spend so much of our time trying to um label everything and put it into boxes and and, and create these kind of um choral responses to stuff and we know that our bodies respond extremely well to being in the great outdoors because it's the environment from whence, whence we've came. We know that people like wild swimming. We know that people like um, nature bathing. We know, that, you know, whatever you want to call it, cooking in the outdoors, like everything. And again, 
stuff I've written about. Um, you can you can scream to the top of your lungs on every social media platform that you can get about why we should be doing this. But until someone's really ready, until they've reached that point, then they're looking and their eyes are open and they're searching for the answer. Quite often, then only then, when that person's actually ready, you know they'll they'll mm-hmm. they'll find a way. Until that point, people can't see. So I had something described to me. People can't see the way they are and the way the fish can't see the water it swims in was like a really good analogy someone described to me once about a certain subject. And I've sort of taken that and thought, yeah, that's, that's quite accurate, actually. Save, save your own energy sometimes. You've got to save your own energy for yourself and go and enjoy it. <laughs> can you, um, Nick, can you tell us some ho- horror stories? Because I think people will find that interesting. Have you, have you had people rock up on your courses and they're just... I think I'm very lucky because I have that filter. We have Louise. So Louise, so if you want to come on one of my courses, you're going to have to go past Louise and or to book me to be a, a speaker or something like that. You're going to go through someone like Tracy um, on those two parts of sort of what I do. And so for the most part, you know, you you kind of have that pre-business chat where you're working out what someone's about and what, what they want. And can you can you meet that kind of standard? I have had some clients that have had some very exacting standards, if that's what you're asking. You know, for instance, uh, I wish to walk through uh, high canopy woodland like I did when I was in a child, as a child. Well, I don't know what their childhood was like, but okay, I can facilitate a whole day of navigating around specifically high canopy woodland. Uh, I wish to um, wild swim with my family in the water. Okay, right. So then we get back from there. I've got to build this package, right? I want to cook over the campfire with my family. I wish to do sleep out in the woods under a tarp, not a tent. I wish to. So you build this whole package using the landscape you've got in front of you. How are you going to get from A to B? What's the med plan? What's all this stuff? And you deliver this incredible package for this very affluent individual and his family to have this incredible uh, weekend. Um, and sometimes sometimes you just need to know after you've been in business for a few years what what is achievable and and what is hang on a minute this person just keeps moving the goalposts as you're getting closer closer to the gig it's like well can we just or we'd like to also we've got two more members of our group coming and you've already agreed on a price so you know in in business that that's something separate um but but yeah there are people out there that will always try to chance their arm and really try to ramp up and squeeze every last bit out of you but ultimately the experience that you can deliver is being diluted or or or, you know because you're stretching yourself out to be able to spin all these plates so sometimes less is more and it's hard to explain that to people um occasionally but but Mm. you have appreciate from an emp- empathetic point of view they're coming at this they've not been on this experience they when you're telling them you've got this incredible 14 acre site of just a carpet of bluebells semi-ancient woodland 400 years blah 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 and you've got this like st- a spring running through the middle and they can do all these amazing things there they can't see that you can see it because you live and breathe it but they can't see that so that's mm-hmm. why they're really pushing to oh and can we just and can we also so that can be tricky at times but again you learn to navigate that stuff mm-hmm like any other business i'm thinking more of the psychology nick of i don't tend to get shall we call it people who aren't really ready for what yeah okay you know because i guess the people who aren't really really ready are doing other things with their weekends it's only like i said when they sort of maybe experience it somewhere maybe they just go to a barbecue and realize that it was just an amazing experience with all these lovely people in a garden sharing food and then like that with the fire, you know, the barbecue, and they just went, oh, my God, I, I want to do more of this. And that leads them down that, that path. Um, it could be something as simple as that. But g- generally, if somebody's lifestyle is geared up towards big nights out, big those kind of big euphoric highs and big crashes, and they just live for the weekend and they're on that kind of cycle, um, yeah, that's not what we're about. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not going out of my way to deliberately send people whitewater rafting or have huge, massive exhilaration jumping out of uh, hot air balloons and stuff because you're chasing that buzz within yourself again and what goes up must come down so it's great they had a great experience they leave me with a fantastic review life is fantastic but what i don't want them for that person on on a moral integral you know kind of level is i don't want them to then leave my course have be like oh my god it's amazing amazing and then <clears throat> crash really hard which is typically what we see and when what you do what do you want? Do you want people to come on your course and, and really get in touch with themselves? 
Um, so I want them to learn. I want them to learn. I want them to open their mind. I want to be able to introduce them to, and this is a Roger Phillips classic, which uh, I'm busy. I'm constantly back in the books. Like I never, I never take the foot off the pace. So all of this stuff here, you know, all the flora and fauna of the UK uh, and the trees, I'm a strong believer that we should all be able to recognise um, 10 basic types of tree in the UK mm. and be able to not only recognise them, but understand what they've given us or what they can give us still today that's that's kind of keeping in touch with the past i'm sat uh, at the top of a, a, a wooden table with wooden chairs all the way around me now these were probably realistically if they're anything like the sort of oak furniture land it's polish oak it's not british oak anymore uh we, we quite frankly don't have the tree crop for that and haven't done for, for many many years so one of the things i teach on my courses is the history of, of British uh, tree crop right the way from sort of Henry VIII right the way through to today. So when you look at a piece of landscape, what you're looking at there is the result of World War One, World War Two. politicians doing the be easiest and best thing in the 50s and 60s, which was just get it in from the empire. Hence on Antiques Roadshow, we always see uh, mahogany, Iroko, drinks chests and things like that. And then as we moved into the 70s and 80s, 90s, there was a real panic on like, oh God, we don't have any tree crop we don't have any furniture industry what are we going to do easiest thing again was plants to pay subsidies to smash in on every available bit of land scots pine douglas fir european larch wherever possible and so you see these three types of essentially failed tree crop on most little pokey little slopes and sides of woodland and land that couldn't be farmed or wasn't didn't have the sort of monetary worth by today's standards uh, and now the best thing we can do with a lot of these is just maintain maintain them, use them to enhance habitat, bees, bird boxes, bat boxes. That's the kind of thing I specialise in day to day until comes that point where I'm going to guess in the next, between now and the next 10 years, the, 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 the pine wood block I own on a slope, there'll be an almighty storm and they'll all go over at the same time because they've all reached the same height, the same level of spindleness where they've, they've all ripped the nutrients out of the ground, competing with each other. They've all been put in too close. Uh... I'll have to go through and spend a lot of time and money but in the meantime, I'm encouraging that understory. So if we think about our four components of woodland, shrub, herb, understory, canopy, that doesn't just happen, broadleaf canopy, uh, to come through and take over. So when I'm a little old grey, what's it with my stick, um, that, that pine wood block will be returned to broadleaf, hopefully. So it's about trying to trying to do 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 Britain a good turn and leave it in a better state than we found it. Um and obviously we can't help what happens in times of war. It was a necessity. We needed duck boarding. We needed um, forestry had to be cut down. Furnaces needed to be kept going. People needed heat in their homes, boilers. You know, there was a huge demand. But all of those workers straight into the guns. Usually, typically at that time in history, father to son lost. Generations of knowledge lost. Uh, a lot of the country estates fell to rack and ruin. Nobody's managing the woodlands. Uh, we prioritise those big, single, straight trees, the ones with the sheets of veneer inside, you know, um, and, and they got, they kind of got left as uh, standards. And everything else got cleared out. That was a sort of quite sort of Victorian model. So to be able to take a group of people, it could be anyone from any walk of life, uh, for them to walk into my woodland, cut a little branch off, leave having made a spoon, but then be really empowered as to how to sustainably harvest stuff, why we coppice, the whole history of British woodlands, all, rest of it, all tied into one day, wrapped up with the usual mental health song and dance that I weave into the day. That's kind of my uh, my sort of, my, it's not just a spoon carving course, is I guess what I'm trying to say. You do realise two bootnecks sat here discussing Britain's wild is it, uh, flora. Yeah. <laughs> We're never going to live this down. <laughs> but I'm not scared. I'm not scared. But I am free of the stigma. I am a free creature. I'm okay yes. with it. Do you no, it's good you say that. In fact, that's probably an important point to touch on. Do you think like being military, you get so indoctrinated into the troop mentality? And pigeonholed by others. So yes. to some people, Valley, I'll forever be Nick the Marine. Because that's yeah. who you be. And it's just easier if you're trying to work out if it's friend or foe, if someone's new, you know, you just go, right, what what's he do? What's he done? What's he about? Okay, boom, box, boxed him off. Yeah, he's Nick the Marine. Not Nick the ethnobotanist, the conservationist, the the presenter, the the, the resilient speaker, the now author. That all that gets out the window. It's just bomb. Was a Marine once, the one chapter of his lifetime. So therefore, that's it forevermore. And of course, that's not necessarily the pinnacle of my life. It doesn't have to be. 
Um, I'm 37 years of age. I've still got a load of stuff in front of me. Um, I'm pretty happy with where things are now internally because I've worked on just solely that for like the last eight, 10 years. Um, and I guess when you kind of reach that, it doesn't mean I don't still have horrendous bad days. I, I definitely still feel things. But um, for the most part, yeah, li life is good because I've chosen to focus on making that my goal as opposed to chasing pots of money or, or whatever else. Uh, and the irony inside of that is when you absolutely love love what you do um and and it's 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 an all-encompassing not just a passion it's a lifestyle for you then you get to a degree good at what you do and then you can command a price and then people recognize that and then the money comes at the end of it anyway um it is what i'm learning so and almost like the the, the less i chase chase it or i'm interested in it the more people kind of recognize elements of noble intent in that person not just me other people and then they want to give you more to do more and then it just it carries on like that mm. so quite interesting isn't it so the proof is always in the pudding expressions like that you know get banded around but that's what i've learned so far um and there are always going to be people out there who want to tag along on the back end of that or want to try and replicate what you like, literally copy word for word what you do but they're still not you so if you're watching this and you've got an idea and you want to go out and do something make it happen still a minority but but a significant minority are doing that nick aren't they i call it, it stepping out the matrix the worm is turning and people are waking up for sure 100 percent. Yeah. So a lot of people are, are reconditioning school buses and li living in them and you know driving across the usa and rejecting i don't even want to call it tradition i just think it's all fabric <laughs> fabricated to destroy us rhetoric rhetoric yeah Fear, fear must be a big one that people stay in the matrix. Uh, well, I mean, it's obviously to a degree, you've got to remember that fear sells, fear sells. So if you can create a fear, you drive the market, whichever direction you want it to go. But, you know, an element of that, how much of that is actually true in whatever given situation we're being shown or sold? Mm -hmm. The percentage is all up in the air, which is where that obscurity is created. And, and that's what, you know, that is off that back of that amygdala hook. Your survival center in the back of your brain is what keeps you watching the news all the time. Because there's a, I might need to know something that's coming on the news is going to be pertinent to my immediate survival in the next 10 minutes. And necessarily, actually, if you break it down half the time, they'll say, this morning, at 8 o'clock this morning, you're eating your cornflakes. A busload of kids went off a, a mountainside in Chile and they all died. Fantastic. Uh, politicians have lied to you. Again, it'd be some sort of a classic story on whatever. And then they'll say, uh, we're, we're, we're at the brink of war. Uh, and then there'll be a journalist there using the word nuclear as many times as humanly possible, saying, does this mean nuclear war? Is this nuclear war? How close is it to nuclear war? Is it likely we'll go to nuclear war? I'm just like, shut up, turn the TV off. I get to a point where I'm literally done with it personally. Um, and a lot of it's also speculation. It's thought that later today, the P Prime Minister will announce. Okay, what time's the announcement? Eight o'clock. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Am I going to stew myself up, stressing and stressing, taking that stress on my drive to work, imparting that on everyone else in road rage? And just that fear, that all encompassing anxiety raising fear is chasing me around for the whole day until eight o'clock. I tune in, I get the message, whatever it is, there's going to be less of this or more of that or whatever. I might as well just go, okay, announcement at eight o'clock, done. Don't watch anything else to the end of the day. Hear what the man's got to say from the horse's mouth. Okay, fine, all woman. Yeah, done. That's it. The rest of it's all just speculative and it might be, it might not. What would this mean? What would this mean? You know, and of course, everybody's given their 10 pence. And for instance, the military stuff, they'll get loads of old ex generals. Who aren't in the mix anymore you know what does this mean i get the general to say something and of course he's saying it freely knowing that there's nothing coming back on him um it's that sort of thing isn't it um but but very rarely do you hear that you know in two towns away uh, a five-year-old girl saved her seven-year-old brother from a house fire there's loads of really good positive stuff that's happened in the world we don't get shown that because that doesn't tick the box that doesn't flick the switch of your 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 fear sensor and so if you think about it, it's not your fault. You're predisposed to seek out danger to try and mitigate it or learn from that to improve your survival. So, of course, we're fed 
a narrative, it keeps us on the hook. But actually, if you look at the long-term effects, swallowing down this kind of stuff, really negative. Uh, so one of the things I did about four years ago was just stop watching the news. Now, I know I say that, uh, having appeared in uh, Telegraph, Daily Mail, things have been happening for me recently, and that's exciting. And more often than not, that has always been a feel-good story. So I've been the I've been the the one percent that gets fettled in there for for a bit of a feel good, but that's probably now I think because people are so many people as you say are switching off, are switching off that they're now like oh we need we need to get people back. How do we get people back? Because not many people are reading newspapers anymore. Everything's digital, and of the digital online stuff, do you really want to be doom scrolling? Mm. So, Mate, do you want to see what I got shoehorned into? Go on. <laughs> or at least the podcast. Let's see it. What are we doing? Soldier Magazine. Uh, so that, <laughs> have you become that expert that they've brought in to talk about? Well, to be honest, you know, for someone who's anti-war and, you know, there's a lot I could say about how our military has been deployed this last 20 years, but they um they spoke very highly of the podcast. They They basically said it's what we already know folks is the be best podcast out there but uh no it, it was very kind of them they talked about the wealth of knowledge that comes up on this podcast they talked about the incredible guests um like i'm talking to now um they like the format that it's just a chat between oppos and nothing you know we're not we're not trying to push ex expose people or trying to get anywhere and they yeah. put me me and lofty on can you believe it that's awesome. Yeah. I think he's got more copies sold than the Bible. <laughs> oh, have yeah, of his uh, SAS survival guide. It's like you said, it's live your dream, isn't it? Did I ever think I'd be sat here being mates with Lofty Wiseman, who was all, our, just our childhood hero? Did you think you'd be here about to go on the MDS? Oh, the Marathon de Sables. Yes. Thank you for mentioning it. That's really kind of you. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I shall I tell you how I got into it? After I ran the length of the country to raise awareness of the veteran suicide problem, I started to get this guy contact me, a, a foreign legionnaire. And he was a, a, a or a foreign legionnaire veteran who now owns a, a, a big or what was a I think a big company before the last three years wiped all this nonsense, you know, the, the nonsense of the last three years, I should say, folks, wiped everyone's businesses out. But anyway, he said, Chris, we march or die. So I said, OK. Marshal Krev. Yeah. <laughs> he said, don't you want to know, like, where? I said, well, not no. really. But he says, Marathon de Sablers, you and me, we march or die. I said, yeah, OK. You you are paying for this, right? Because you know it's it's five grand to get in, and then it's two thousand <laughs> two thousand pound for equipment. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so I'm seven. Th th this this will make sense where I'm going with this, Nick. That I'm seven grand into this now, right? Um, and anyway, so he said, yeah, do you want to know like, you know, something about me and do you want my resident? I'm like, no, just, I'll see you at the start line. Uh, if you're shit, I'll leave you behind. <laughs> <laughs> On your terms. Very I'm, well done. I'm joking. I'm joking folks. You know, I love buddying up with people, but <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no dude, if you're going to pay for me to enter the marathon from the sands, uh, yeah, of course I'll do it with you. Secondly, do you know it's a three year waiting list? Yeah, so just out, out of interest, I contacted the race neck and um, spoke to a woman called Sarah who runs the kind of English side of things. And she said, listen, we've got two spaces that that because of all the lockdown, pe people are just having to drop out. Yeah. And I said, right, I'll I'll take them. And so I went back to our uh, our. Um, uh, our monsieur and uh, I said, "Look, I've got us two places," <laughs> and, I, and I never heard from him again. Oh no! By which point, I'm locked. I'm locked into this, aren't I? You know, as someone who loves doing challenges, 
I've managed yeah. to get two spaces for what is usually a three year waiting list. Uh, and so I, let's just say I, I, um, someone very kindly gave me the money, Nick, cause I can't afford that sort of shit, you know? Um, some, somebody died and left, left me, left somebody some money and they said, Chris, they would have wanted you to have this five grand. Um, so I've just paid for the equipment and, um, yes, it's, uh, it's in about a week's time, mate. So awesome. friends who are wondering what we're talking about, it's a 250 mile ultra marathon across the Sahara desert Sahara. In, yeah. in, in Morocco, carrying all your own self-sustaining equipment and sleeping under like a Bedouin tent each night. Um, I think 2021 out of the 1200 people that started, I think yeah. eight, 80 finished. <laughs> well, it was an unusually tough, tough year, but yeah. just, just highlighting how tough it can be and how excellent I am. <laughs> and, uh, no, I know I'm I'm going to be running uh, in aid of my friend's uh, child and dog rescue centre in Tanzania, and I don't I'm not taking a mick when I say that he literally res rescues children uh, with learning disability from the witch doctors. Um, right. Some uh, you we're going to come on and talk about Africa, it, but you know there's, there's some th horrible stuff goes can can go on in tribal Africa. Well, some horrible stuff can go on in Plymouth, but I think I know what you're referring to. Yes, I've yeah. uh, I've been around certain areas where certain um, practices which are abhorrent take place uh, with beliefs driven behind them, which are completely. Um, completely wrong on every level unscientific so, beyond yeah mm. yes and he also rescues dogs which i seem to remember from mozambique they get a particularly hard time in in um, tribal africa um yeah. so uh yes yeah, so i'm running and and the chap who runs the chat is called john st julian he's an incredibly popular youtuber and i started to watch john about five years ago when i was doing some gardening and he started to talk about the the scriptures in a way that i'd never heard anybody uh talk about certainly never heard anyone in church explain to me what what they actually mean not what not what people think they mean Interpretation. And, um, yeah and it sent me on a journey nick that uh it's been priceless it's, yeah it's been it might even have been a lifesaver for all i know um for someone with <laughs> someone with my history so so yes that's it were you uh were you ever a, a speed a, what do we call them a speed snake a racing snake racing snake i was a i was a rare breed creature so i was uh, a bit more of your troop donkey could yomp forever with everything on would be the gpmg gunner or the light light machine gunner um but no i had that ability to run a bft in uh fastest i ever run it was sort of 750 something in boots you know around the camp either at pool or, or uh up at four or five i had that ability to run like a horse um and i never really struck athleticism was and strength was kind of my my uh my forte for the for the most part of my uh formative career in the core and then as time went on it all became all about that um using language skills and other interesting stuff took over so uh, gesticulation uh, communication without um non-verbal communication and stuff like that so being able to just get dropped in and work with other cultures and places and countries and yeah more more interesting work yeah okay what tell me what this means then hang on yeah uh, run like hell godzilla <laughs> hey mate you're not far off it's um run like fuck there's a bear behind you oh, okay okay <laughs> yeah. do as you know it's just elbow to the face of the fat american next to you and out outrun them <laughs> that's our brothers and sisters across the pond oh uh, i saw that was uh one of our brothers chap called uh scanner or nicknamed scanner in nor in where we we're doing some sign language in norway i think it was or we were we we're in a briefing and it's right right what sign language are we going to use <laughs> i love it i love it yes so um 
mate, I just wrote down the 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 the, the premise of your book or the sections: relax and rejuvenate, Redi right. rediscover, yeah, and reconnect. Can you just talk us through what that philosophy is meant meant to mean? So when I started the Woodland Warrior Program, I used to say uh, recuperate, recalibrate, re-engage. So people would come to me disengaged. Uh, the first thing you'd need to do is just recoup, just spend some time in the environment, soaking all that up, get the head into the right mind space to have those all important conversations, learn some new skills, realize they're a team member. So that's that recalibration phase happening. And then ultimately, once they leave the course, they're ready to re-engage with the world and, uh, and, and, and make a change and... I don't know if they need to, whatever they need to do, go and go on to some other talking services, go and get some NLP, EMDR, CBT, go and focus on doing a job that you don't really want to do for a short period of time with the game plan of getting your car wheels back on the road, which then leads to the job you want to do because of whatever. Everyone's got sort of an individual re recovery pathway and everything is um, it's centred around each individual. So it's an individually centred course although they're, they're, they're coming together as a group, you know, it's, it's, it's focused on each individual and everyone needs something different, right? So that's kind of how that works. So when we move over to the book, I've changed the word slightly to relax and rejuvenate, which is basically recuperate, uh, rediscover. So rediscover yourself, that recalibration, and then reconnect, re-engaging. So I've used that model from the Woodland Warrior to help kind of break the book down. If you look at the chapters here, so part one is all about forest bathing, going wild every day. That's talking about your 15 minute minimum headspace walk on your lunch break, whatever it is. Even in the depths of British winter, put your coat on, leave the office and walk around the block, feel the breeze on your face, you know, get outdoors. Um, bringing nature into your home. So lots of top tips for uh, any any home. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm looking at a wood burner in this room. There's a wood burner in the other room. On the shelves, there's quite often those big Corsican pines uh, pine cones they look like they've got frosted tops on them you always see them in the uh, coffee shop windows around christmas time they look like they've been dipped in sugar um there is driftwood in the downstairs toilet with some shells and some stones from exmouth beach from a nice day out on the harbor bringing the outdoors indoors okay that's what that kind is about and surrounding the subject of fire candles scented candles incense sticks all that kind of stuff there's a whole heap of stuff you can do to make your house or your apartment smell like cedarwood, sandalwood, with those kind of notes and tones which we associate the the, the kind of old grey matter, the dinosaur part of your brain associates with safety, serenity, being in a big woodland, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so and then so uh, wild swimming, whole section on that. Rediscover, we're talking about making wild cups of tea, getting out, sleeping under the moon and stars, foraging, carving, creating, actually like hands-on bushcrafty type stuff. Um, how to hold a knife, there's some different techniques for stuff, mm. you know, tips and bits. And then part three, very importantly, is about reconnecting around the fire. And I've, I've gone into depth to, to write about not just like how to make a fire, so that's in there, and different types of fire for different purposes, but how to facilitate those conversations? Because as I've written in the book, and I, I alluded to the barbecue earlier, getting family members, um, I'm using family because nine times out of 10, you choose your friends, not your family in this life. And as we get older, um, people often say nothing separates a family like money or, uh, or, or taxes, it was ta taxes and death. I can't remember what the uh, expression is about that, but um you know, and you see it more and more where families are divided and cousins aren't talking to each other and brother and sister have fallen out and parents aren't talking because they're not doing with the money what they envisaged that they were going to do and everybody, like, ends up a bit fractured and speaking their mind. Well, a family barbecue can be the ideal place to kind of rekindle that. And it also has the space because it's often outdoors. If somebody needs to take a phone call and walk off, save a bit of face instead of being in a confrontation or in a small room environment where somebody storms off and knocks over the chair and walks out and that's it. We're not talking for another two months. It's that whole kind of thing, right? So reconnecting around a fire, how to have those conversations. Uh, and it's, it's kind of focusing on, on the, the secret source, the EQ, the soft skills. Um, so it's not just about why it's good to be outdoors and uh, the chemical compounds released by trees phytocytes you know what they do for our immune system immune boosting 
you're looking at someone that just doesn't get ill. I wasn't very, very, very rarely you're going to see me with a snotty nose. I'm, and I'm outdoors, hands in the muck, manure, all sorts, all day, every single day. And those biomes, you know, my body's biologically designed. If my immune system's at top form, okay, and I'm, I've not got loads of load and stress on my CNS, I can fight off just about everything. Mm. It's only when you suddenly go into town where millions of people are living on top of each other in a concrete jungle and you touch a handrail that you get some horrendous disease that no one's ever seen before <laughs> and then you can get quite poorly then. Um, I digress. So you've got then you've got your final thoughts, a bit more about the author, further reading and acknowledgements. So it's not a massive book. You know, it's uh, how many pages did I put in this thing? Two, 214 pages. Um, fairly big sort of size, decent text you're not going to be like trying to read it and i, I opted for the hardback because i think that's quite a good classy thing and we found a lovely lovely um illustrator to to help us with bring this to life and i wanted some elements from here in the valley so the chew valley lake and and you've got both pine and broadleaf in the picture here and somebody who's about to go on a journey so this was this was all kind of very much thought of and then obviously at the top of the title rewild your mind I'm not sure i could have done a collaborative with it with welbeck much more of a job to really try to and if you look really carefully you'll even see a heron down here um and i don't know if you believe in this sort of thing but the heron is the guardian is is, is the guardian is the vessel uh between two between two like transition represents transition and change and um it wasn't uh, the guardian for my my nan's goldfish bloody ate, the, it bloody ate them it would have been the grim reaper, <laughs> that been the reaper that. it's the stalk that brings us babies as well and also remember. <laughs> yes i think that heron thought he was on to an easy meal just uh oh, they are straight up savage if you've got a koi carp pond and they put that netting over the top praying that that'll foul it but the beak is like this long mm. just punches through the incredible, incredible birds, though, Nick, when you see them in, in the nature. They, I, I like heron, uh, nuthatch, any kind, any kind of woodpecker is always amazing amazing yeah. to see. we got peregrine falcons not, not far from me. Yeah, yeah, they are making a real comeback. There are some uh, on the edge of Bristol in, up in some of the buildings mm. nesting. Um, they really are coming back. It's fantastic to see. Yeah. Right. I've, uh, so, a couple of things. So, what's your thoughts on uh, bushcraft knives? And what if if someone wanted to invest in one as a sort of a special thing to kick off their bushcraft career? Um, what would you recommend? Personally, having been right around the houses now, to the point, to the point where, hang on, let me see what's in my pocket. Let me see what my everyday carry is. So, on my set of keys. There's a good old classic, Officer's uh, Victorian Ox um, penknife, three inches non-lockable. In my pocket, there's a little Victorian Ox case. This is what I tend to carry every day. There's a lighter, and I think this model is called the Walker because it's got a little pruning saw on there uh, and a main blade and, and, and maybe something for opening bottles. Not much more. So it's ideal for when you're out walking and whatnot. This is where it comes down to. Um, how personalised do you want to go? Because you can get knives that are individually serialised, that have got all sorts of... You can choose the colours of the liners that go between the steel. If it's a mm. full blade, you can choose iroco, ironwood, carbon fibre, micarta, all kinds of rosewood, silver birch. Oh, that's so, nice. You yeah. Get really, I mean really good stuff. Every steel under the sun, it just goes on, right? Or... You could also get a little knife that lasts you your whole life as long as you're not uh, a what's it with it and you can pass it down to yourself, irrespective of that, for about 40 quid, which will do any environment on the planet uh, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll see you through. And so what I'm talking about there are your sort of mid-range... It, it, let, let's take the model... Let's take the Swedish model Mora, Mora knives, right? Been reinvented... And remember that the knife has been reinvented more times than any other tool since it was just a piece of polished green stone hand axe. It's been reinvented. Mm. So there are some fantastic steels out there now. Uh, I went on a personal journey a couple of years ago to create a knife. 
that journey's come to an end. It was amazing. A prototype, we, we field tested, we developed. We found this steel called Nylox Plus. It's now shipping and fishing industry steel in all of the Scotland. It outperforms stainless by 400%. It's got vandium and loads of uh, like like hardening, um, all, all the all the good bits of a high carbon blade with all the best bits and better of a, a stainless blade. Why would you not make it out of that? Quite frankly, mm. that's now hitting the markets. Lots of people are, are following that trend. It's a pig to work with because um, any blacksmiths on here will know you've got like when you're going through the hardening process, you've got to wrap it up in like foil and it's got all these extra things that go with it. Um, but in terms of a no nonsense, never need to wipe it. Like wipe it over once in a blue moon. It, you could just leave it in a bucket of seawater. Nothing's going to happen to it. It's absolutely bombers. You sell them, Nick? Is yeah, that... I used to. I used to. Yeah, uh, we sold twenty three. They were all individually serialized. So that's the sort of thing I'm on about. That's your really, really high end, highest end knife you could possibly get. Uh, I can't get it for less than three hundred and fifty. And it comes in its box and all the rest of it. So by the time I need to mark up my price, sell it to the to the uh, whoever it is, it's got to go posted packaging. I'm barely turning a hundred quid, but I'm putting turnover on my business of nearly five hundred quid. These things are four seven five, so I'm putting all this turnover on, um, and I'm, I'm not actually making a, a, a very good percentage out of that. So it was more a passion project. Um, and I'm very proud. And so in circulation, there are people that have these knives, but that journey's now come to an end. So. I'm leaving that for now. I am about to have some very serious talks with a couple of uh, companies uh, in coming months. I can't say too much about branding and Hidden Valley Bushcraft and some other stuff, which is exciting. Um, but a number of things on my little journey have come to an end. So Hidden Valley Bushcraft YouTube channel, that, that's done. I, I stepped away from that. Uh, I took that time out to focus on growing myself into the resilient speaking and all the other bits and pieces. Get this done, get this out, which has happened. Um, and now I've returned to YouTube. I've got a teeny tiny little page. Um, it's nothing, it's not, I'm not, I'm not going at it hammer and tongs. I'm not filming every single week, spending tons of fuel through the landy and buying kit and equipment, gear reviews coming out my ears. What I am doing is uh, putting on all of the knowledge that I've accrued behind the scenes, all the shorts showing my uh, off-grid homestead that we have here, how I'm collecting tons of water off the roof, making sure that that's filtered, using that, all the kind of, I guess, behind the scenes sort of knowledgeable stuff. Um, and then there's going to be a handful of like high-end videos that go on there, about 20 minutes long max, um, showing uh either the sort of things that i'm talking about when i'm resilient speaking or trips to south africa lesotho into really really remote little locations um one i did a couple of years back um working with some orphans out there on a humanitarian project where british armed forces veterans were going out there i was there in sort of a staff capacity to help oversee them um making a big turnaround to that area and we're talking about a place which is four hours by land cruiser through the mountains from the nearest town. So the nearest hospital, the nearest anything is four hours away through the mountains on an immaculately built Chinese road. And where the Chinese road stops, you've then got a dirt track. And then a bit further up there, you've got a handful of little buildings. Um, it's at altitude. For those who don't know, Lesotho is like a little, uh, it, it sits in the pocket of South Africa, but it's not South Africa, it's its own principality. It's well known for having diamond mines and other interesting points of interest on the mineral side of things. Um, but the reason we were there uh, working on behalf of a charity was to give back, um, to prove to ourselves as British veterans that our skill sets are still viable. We can work as a team and we are can do resilient people. So we were out there for about three weeks um, building, guttering, um, clearing out an old creepy old hospital. It was like something out of a horror movie that area had been struck really hard by HIV. Um, to get a hairs on the back of my neck going up thinking about it. There was a morgue. You could see in the morgue they were stacking people 10 high in this giant refrigerated morgue uh, and they'd had to buy in external units and, and they had to buy in extra units there. The Chapel of Rest was still as it was with a table uh, with a big drain going out the back uh, in the concrete. Proper creepy, very religious people, lots of uh, Christian writing all over the walls of the hospital, lots of um, psalms and, and extracts from the Bible. 
Uh, I mean, just just think about sort of one of those computer games or horror movies with the zombies and you're walking through, there's no lights on. And in every room, there's just X-ray machines just left in status, nothing happening with them. So we were dragging these massive lumps of cast iron out, dragging them all out into the, uh, the sort of foyer area and then out to the top of the hospital. All the ceiling was coming down anyway. So we were there with masks on and whatever we could. I had my hood and my coat on. I was trying to to take down hundreds of years of bleh, skin cells and all sorts of stuff coming out from in there, removing all the uh, urinals, the bath, all the stuff, proper, nasty, gritty, hard work um, to create a light, airy skills college where these young shepherd boys who in their culture, women, uh, the young ladies are given an education and go to work and the boys as young as six are sent off to become shepherd boys in the hills. So no reading, no writing. They're incredibly intelligent. They're incredibly quick to learn. They don't spend all day long going, Siri, how do I? So they have to figure it out. So if you show them something once, they've got it. And so the video I recently put up on this new YouTube channel is, uh, it's uh, if you type in just Nick Goldsmith, Rewild Your Mind, it should come up with the channel. Maybe or maybe not. The algorithm doesn't even know I exist at 600 subscribers, so you'll have to look for it. But if you mate, find I'm it- just going to stop you there and say that you, you don't have to be humble, mate. Well, <laughs> it, it's it's early bush, days. Bushcraft so- cha- bushcraft channels do incredibly well. Well, because- hopefully, it gets up. hopefully it gets picked up eventually. And also, a bushcraft but- channel hosted by a by a former commando is that's a good recipe for for a successful YouTube channel, mate. Well, we'll we'll see what happens. I mean. It's a very busy uh, platform. Uh, there's a lot of noise on there. There's a lot more uh, new people out there right now. So I'm just happy to be contributing good quality content that's hopefully going to teach people. Um, the big takeaway from this this little video that you'll see, uh, the recent one, is that I could not find a single person to teach me. And I was really excited about learning um, the secrets of hand drill out there or maybe fire plow or, or you know fire thong like something else that that maybe i don't specialize in because i tend to always lean towards being in the climate we're in uh using the mechanical advantage of a bow bow drill method seems to be the best one to work for me i have the most amount of experience i'm most comfortable teaching although i can do the others it's epic sometimes in different environments so i'm really excited i ask the lads i say can you you know the interpreter can you tell me about making fire do they you know, have they been shown and out came the answer, matches, matches. Mm-hmm. And they've got these little Chinese books of matches, and they've just been com- completely reliant on matches. So I said, go find me the oldest person in this village. And this little old lady turned up with no tea. And uh, same question was asked, matches. I was like, oh. So we reverse engineered it. We found, uh, I, I recognised what looked like a willow down by the river. Um and I wanted to teach them anyway because they were they were jumping up and down and ripping all the branches off in this in the winter months to to, to take the branches off to burn to keep warm uh, about sustainably harvesting so that they get more branches etc rather than just putting the tree into um into into some sort of state of shock and then it dies. There's not exactly a lot of trees around there as it is. Mm. Any woodland are owned by the government and they don't have rights to access them. And so the other wood I managed to harvest for them were all of the, there was apples and what looked like some sort of an apricot tree with a very dark, dark, dark bark. And that's probably how it's reacted to dealing with the African sun. And I had a Nordic pocket chainsaw and I was doing all the chainsaw work around the outside of these trees that were growing into the hospital roof. So they had, we had some firewood to play with. I used the willow. I made a fire by friction set. As you'll see in the video, I've done the voiceover and showed them how to do it. Here, I decided to go for it. I made myself a full set for fire by friction using the bow drill method and I attempted to make a fire in front of them. I gave up one of my shoelaces, made a bow, a drill, a half board and a bearing block. Watch as we create heat, embers and eventually fire. Found some sort of a bush that was very similar to gauze. It looked like gauze. It was like a tumbleweed you'd see rolling around everywhere. It obviously had some strong volatile oils running through it because when it does go, I mean, I've burned holes in my shirt because um, I knew there was a camera crew on me. I was, I was like, just, just act, you know, act all like it'd be fine, but I was properly on fire. Um, and I was buzzing because I've never done it before. It was all shot in one take. It's as real as it gets. I've not 
had time to prepare, the camera crew were rolling around the site, talking to different people and capturing. One of the veterans was doing a load of plumbing work, reconnecting all the plumbing and stuff. It's all push fit out there um, because the well used to tr- run dry almost almost daily. Towards the end of the day, there'd be not much water left for everyone because uh, we're at altitude and we're adding strain to that. So our team are out there drinking six litres of water a day. That makes the difference sometimes on, on a finely balanced system. Um, electricity, the generator used to cut out and so you'd only have power till like eight o'clock at night or 10 and it would die uh so it was a it was a real thing and the camera crew were going around filming all the different sections that the veterans were doing so one of the guys there was a carpenter and was teaching these boys how to make tables and bits and pieces from the available timber some of which was repurposed um you know those military benches with the fold out legs with the three yeah, they, they they look like death traps well they were weren't they and you'd sit on them and you'd either fly back or the legs would fold in or yeah so they had some of those in the hospital we used some of the broken ones to make shuttering to then knock up concrete by hand to make a plinth for a huge water plastic water bowser to come once we'd finished reconnecting all the guttering to catch water on the roof so that they have more water like additional gray water for washing in and things like that um typical example so the camera crew would be up there suddenly they appear at my bit and i'm teaching them how to use a knife and uh, how to use a knife and a saw how to be safe because the responsibility it dawned on me if i'm going to show these chaps how to do this uh, and some of them are really young once i'm gone four hours to the nearest hospital what are you going to do if you end up with a catastrophic bleed so that's serious uh, or if you end up very poorly so um so there was that did you uh, see any um did you see any puff adders while you were I there didn't see any puff adders i saw a sh1t load of wild dogs and at night time when i was in my so i chose to sleep outside the accommod- accommodation was tiny and we were all crammed in so i took one of the adventure tents and i set it up outside and there was a, a row of stones so i made a fire pit and I, I i lit a fire every night and i sat out there and i think there's one little bit of footage i've got which i'll try and get in the next video where i'm talking about my leaving thoughts before i left and how it's affected me that that trip and you see the fire pit and i'm walking i'm like I'm walking back to the penthouse it's just a green van gogh tent but i was counting the dogs going around against the flames you could see the silhouettes of the dogs at night time walking past <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I slept with my knife in my boots by my head inside the sleeping bag, but I didn't get, you know, I didn't get bothered by them. They were, they were all right. They they're, just- um, for people that haven't got what we would call a lot, they're remarkably happy, aren't they? And they're remarkably resilient. Incredible, incredible story of resilience. I mean, age six years old at altitude sent out in the mountains, which are cold at night. And you've got to keep a herd of 40 sheep alive. Um, you've got to stop other shepherd boys from pinching your sheep and uh, rear them, get them all ready to go, to go to market, pick up another lot, do it again. Pretty brutal, by our our standards, a brutal existence. Mm. But that's what they know. So they all, they have like an interesting dress code where they wear Wellington boots, a massive woolen overcoat that they like, they have different ways of pinning it, a bit like a Spartan sort of cloak and a full face balaclava. So it's a hat by day and it's a full face balaclava by night. Have you got a visitor? Yeah, I'm just uh, looking at the map map here now. And um, are they, do they carry slingshots and have they got like lions oh, oh, to contend have, with? What do they call it? Uh, they have a stick, a big stick that's wrapped with like copper or lead or, and they, they do stick, stick fighting. Have you ever seen that African stick fighting? Mm savage yeah. and so every shepherd boy has a they have like um it was it, we did ask them about it and they were so secretive they have their version of like a joining run and it's it's a highly secretive initiation to become a shepherd boy and then you get given your stick and 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 your cloak and you know and that's it you're, you're in the gang then um so we were teaching them english and maths admittedly i'm not fantastic at maths and i was not surprised to learn that they were asking me questions and i was like uh i think he's on about long division um someone else <laughs> wanting me to show them how to set out the long division so i'm like when was the last time i wrote down long division moons ago mm-hmm. 
But everything else by day, I I do my sort of brand of survivally stuff with them and foraging and whatever else, and 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 then I jump back into the matrix of working like a machine uh, in the African sun, and then they'd hand over to one of the other guys would do carpentry, one of the other guys would show them how all the connections go from the tap to get to wherever and how you can build pressure for using different size pipe and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Very clever. I loved it. Um, I did promise Louise I wouldn't go on any other harebrained adventures, any other gallivanting until Finn was at school. Finn is going to school in September, people. So hence I am now just starting by the time this has gone out, getting ready to leap into appearing in other bits and pieces so it's exciting, but I've, I've I've stuck to my word. I've not gone anywhere for Finn was three months old when I did that trip, and he's now nearly four. Mm. So I've been UK based since then. Mm. Nick, the last thing I, I wanted to ask you about um, is wild swimming has become incredibly popular, hasn't it? And it, anything to do with cold water? It has. It has immersion. Uh, a whole chapter on that. Hang on a minute. Let me whiz through and see. I'm trying to remind myself so that I don't say something that's not in the book, but it should be in the book. There are, it has become so popular and there are such a number of things to consider, I guess. I mean, you, you do a lot of swimming. I know you do. So do you swim alone? Um, yeah, I'm a bit of a, I'm one of these people do what I say, don't do what I do. Right. Okay. You know, so um, is, um, um, well, see pictures of me, swimming in the river too on myself but on my own uh i'm taking we're all taking a risk right when we do that just go with someone else it's just easier there is a percentage chance that your heart might stop and not not start again when you immerse yourself in cold water but there are breathing techniques there are a number of things you can do to prepare your body physiologically for getting into water but there's also a number of other sneaky hidden dangers and i think i've written so my swimming advice so on every page you've got like this gray section which gives you your breakdowns and then at the end you'll have like a recap so your rewilding reminder at the end of every chapter there's a rewilding reminder so the rewilding reminder here is that if you want to feel alive spend a few minutes in cold wild water it will instantly change your mood you'll get out the river sea or lake feeling incredible you'll feel exhilarated energized freer and lighter which i think is kind of how i feel when i get out of wild water i just feel like i've yeah Beware of Britain's most poisonous plant. I never see this being talked about enough. So hemlock water drop wart, there's a picture of it there. It's a very benign looking plant with a parsley like leaf with a celery type stem, umbelliferous head. Um, think of the word umbella for umbrella. Uh, carrot parsley is the first one that always comes to mind. White umbelliferous head, right? That stuff is so bad for you. It's not funny. It's got about nine different types of alkaloid in there which your body's renal system does not recognize does not have an answer for there is no cure for and it's uh it's not a way good way to go uh start to finish could be as little as three hours if it's ingested or if it goes in through a cut through the sap in your eye there's a number of ways of of in you know interacting with this stuff and i have seen people firsthand here in the valley desperate to do some wild swimming um especially through lockdown they appeared in their thousands throwing beach towels over it, crushing it all down, and that sap going into their towels and probably wondering why they're getting home while they're burning. Or We're talking about something in the same family as the giant hogweed, um, also in the same family as things that we can eat, parsley, uh, um, sweet sisley, angelica, the parsnip, the carrot. It's all in that carrot family, right? But then there's some, also some big nasties in there. The biggest thing about this... Uh, hemlock water drop wart is that it's in almost all our ditches and waterways you're not going to get rid of it it is it is there to stay we've lived alongside it for a number of years but now what's happening is more and more of us are interacting in, in wild spaces in little corners and crooks and bits and places anywhere where you've got enough to just cover yourself with water you'll find someone in it nowadays while swimming or you know cold water immersion and so the, the, the percentage likelihood of you running into this stuff has now gone up much higher which is why i've highlighted it i'm not poo-pooing wild swimming i'm not trying to say don't wild swim because this you know you're all gonna die i'm saying that there is a likelihood that you may um be using it swathes of it to get up out of the river and you don't know what you're pulling pulling off in your hands you've only got to lick your hands or, or get like say rub your eye or something uh, and you're in a bad way. Learn to recognize your flora and fauna in your immediate space. 
Um, go and be happy and safe. Enjoy wild swimming while you can. Get out there. There's lots of wild swimming groups. There's quarries opening up all over the place who are having like approved. You can you can pay and spend a certain amount of time there if you want to go down that sort of approved route. There are tons of little pockets in our, our waterways, um, but just always in the back of your mind, be mindful of that. That's one whole argument. You've then got the fishermen. There are fishermen watching this channel right now going, and he's not talking about the damage to the gravel beds and the trout can't spawn because everyone's stepping all over it. Well, that's also got to be thought about, right? So there's a balance to these things. It's okay you go wild swimming, but if you and 50 other people or your wild swimming spot gets put up on a Dog Walkers UK wild swimming spot UK web website, that site is about to get descended upon, especially on a hot summer's day. And of course, that changes your, your river ecology, that ch changes your, your conservation piece. Least of all, do you know your pH levels in your water? So because of the farming model that we've had here in the valley for, for quite a long time, when the, when the water was last recorded in the River Chew, it was 10 times the amounts of nitrates that there should be. And remember that you're going to absorb potentially 10 times the nitrogen that you should be. So if you end up with a skin irritation or something going on, we've all got to share this wonderful space called nature. So we've all got to just be that little bit more savvy about what we're doing. So I'll leave you with that parting thought. Mm. Hopefully that's a balance. For you. Yeah. I mean, you're saying what you've got to say, but it's, um, I'm all for it. I'm all it, for it, it. it. It's yeah. It's the same with the wild, wild camping, isn't it, mate? Like, one or two people go and have a little wild camping experience. Amazing. 30,000 people descend over the course of 365 days in the same area. That is going to start to leave a mark. It's going to start to show. It's going to start to degrade and damage the environment that we're in. So, yeah. Yes. To the other side of the coin, we're in such a controlled nanny state that you, you can't even take your kid out legally and make a fire. Yeah. Which I, I would just, you know, I wouldn't say this, folks, because I'm a podcast host, but I'm sure my mate Steve would tell everyone to ignore that. So long as, <laughs> so, so long as you, ex Steve would recommend like exercising caution, you don't want to, yeah. you know, you don't want to set fire to the peat. Um, and you don't, you don't want to. Peat and coal deposits. Any land where coal has been mined previously, mm. in one of our areas, 12 inches under the soil, there is a coal seam running through. So I cannot, I cannot have a fire on there whatsoever. Mm. Can't. You set fire to a coal seam. Three weeks later, your 13th century church on the other side of the village drops into a massive. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And also during the summer, you've got to be incredibly, obviously, when everything's tin tinder dry. But yeah, yeah. it's um, there. There are risks, that, but there's risks to everything. And we're now just it's not just risk adverse. I think these measures are put in place just to turn people into sissies risk aware not risk adverse that's the model we do with, with finn with parenting that's why he, he's having a tree house uh, that i'm building right now and he's climbing all over it and i haven't even got the deck down but he's you know his dexterity is there his strength is coming through he might have a bump i'm on hand but uh what i'm not doing is going oh don't touch that oh don't do this oh god because oh. he's mm. he, was he ever gonna? How was he ever gonna navigate this thing called life? Nick, do you swim all year round? I do. Yeah, I got dragged out with uh, another great veteran, Simon Harmer. He's got a YouTube channel called the Amputee Swimmer. Uh, Simon was 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 um, most unfortunately lost both his legs in, in the conflict in Afghanistan, having served all around the world uh, from the Congo to all sorts uh, army biathlon. He was quite the athlete at the time, um, and he has found himself again feeling free, feeling no, you know, no further above or below anyone else once he's in the water, in his, in his own mind. And he absolutely loves wild swimming. And the man is basically part human, part seal. We went down to the River Chew and it was not warm. My hands were going down. I was like, mate, I've got to get out. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, fine. Just on his back. And he can be in the water for like 40 minutes at a time. I'm also wading in, doing the breathing stuff and get ready to dip my head, you know, get straight into it. He sort of, obviously, once he's taken his legs off, kind of shuffles himself up to the bank and then throws himself straight in in a one -er. It's pretty impressive. I've, mm -hmm. I've swum Clevedon as well, the Marine Lake up there uh, in, in Bristol. Uh, and again, just a phenomenal individual um, and a real inspiration for me because I was like, oh, if he can do it, I can do it. 
So getting out all year round. Um, buy yourself a decent, I don't want to name a company, but a big overthrow robe thing you can put on afterwards. There's lots of companies doing them out there. Some of them are way more expensive than others. And when you actually look at what they're made of, it's the same thing. So, yeah, go go find yourself a, a decent little routine to get nice and dry and warm afterwards while you're having that exhilaration, that lighter feeling going on. Um, because I can tell you, taking an old dog towel down to the River Chew sucks. You're like that. You're like, Ugh. And I'm looking over at him, and he's got this massive robe on, and he's like, what's up with you? And I'm like, I'm freezing. <laughs> So, yeah, I learned some lessons from him. Yes. Yes, it's interesting. I um, I was in cold water for, must have been the best part of 10 minutes this morning, which is, that's good. That's the most, the Bravo. most I've done. But yeah, the thing is, I will hold my hand up and say, you know, I was in the sauna for three quarters of an hour. Friends at home, if you're going to do running in a sauna, make sure you've got someone sat outside checking up on you in case uh, you have a wobble. Make sure you check with your GP first. Not really necessary to do unless I'm doing it because of the marathon in the in the desert next week. Um, but after three quarters of an hour of, well, I was doing step up, Nick, which just felt just the same. <laughs> after three quarters of an hour, felt sure. just as, just as uh, knackering as running. And, and then it was, you know, then I'm okay to get in the plunge pool and i like I said, I just sat in there for 10 minutes, which is unusual for me because I usually like in the winter, especially when it's you have to break the ice on it. I'm in, I'll go, I always go straight under. And then miss. I might, I might do 30 seconds and I'll write, sod that for a game of soldiers. It's too hard. Honestly, so, mate. That is strong. I've got plates and screws in my face. Hold on, there's a story for another day, but I've been a bit of a boy in my life, and uh, along with the cauliflower and missing teeth, etc. But the cold does not do me any... Everywhere I've broken a bone, <laughs> you start to feel it. Uh, yeah. I definitely start to but, feel but it. But there's some people out there that just swim all year round in, in just a, a bathing yep. suit. Yeah. And, I mean, even if I went... To, I mean, I've thrown myself in, down here in the sea in, in February when it's bitter right bitter yeah but like i say i'm in i might swim five or six strokes underwater and then i'm out again nick i'm out oh, yeah but you've, got, you've got what you've got what you needed you've reset that whole body system you've got that brown fat activated you've got all that goodness all the heart rate's gone through the roof it's the elation is happening the endorphins are released all that good <laughs> stuff is happening for the body you don't need to spend half an hour in there and give yourself a cold weather injury <laughs> No, but some people do though, and I'm, I, I think they're carrying a bit more timber than me. Can we say like Tim Crossin, the cold dip commando? <laughs> yeah, he's, watch, what a chap! I've been following his journey. Mm, yeah, yeah, nice bloke. He's he's overcome a lot to be doing. Uh, you know, he's still not very well, Nick. Um, yeah, bless him. He's um, you know, rec re remission or whatever you call it, or recovery. Yeah, my um, mom mission. It, it takes. And the thing is, how long are you in remission for? It takes years and they've got to go for the checkups and they end up living the fear. You end up living between you're sort of like, all right, yeah. get the or mum was, and then it builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And then it's she's really difficult to be with sometimes. And then then she has another okay, right, we're okay, and then all the pressure's gone, you know, she's fine again. And it builds till the next scan. Yeah. yeah. Ah, ah. Oh. This is this is this is why I talk about this almost like literally every every day okay Le learn ph folks don't put yourself in that position in the first place you know burgers are lovely i i like a good burger i like steak and i don't eat it every day no. i eat vegetables you know and then i run a thousand miles non-stop so i must be doing doing something right you know yeah nick look it's been an absolute pleasure. It's nice just to bounce stuff off each other because I've, I've always got a million questions in this area. I hope I've asked you everything that our uh, our friends at home would have wanted me to. We could have gone. We could go on for another hour, but yeah. But people just don't have time to watch long form podcasts anymore. And um, that's true. That's true. I don't know where uh, we're at. We'll be around an hour, aren't we? Yeah, but listen, we're going to put a link for Rewild Your Mind below the podcast, folks. So grab yourself a copy. I'm really looking forward to my copy turning up any 
any day any day now um, I, I i can tell you now i've got 50 books on my shelf that i've been sent to chris hey there we go there we go uh, but that is one that i really do look forward to reading because i'll i consider that uh part of my personal journey uh nick so thank you ever so much for what you've done for me and what what you're doing for for everybody else it's like life's a spiral you're either putting out the good energy and taking everybody in the planet up with you or or yeah just you, you, you know i mean it's really the, the people the people that have taken the time to like bung me a fiver for what i'm doing next week it's like they're or, or share a post if they haven't got a five just share one of my posts or tag a mate in it like they're, they're taking humanity up but at the same time you've got you've got this kind of way of being now of just sitting surfing the internet yeah. look at that now i'm not going to support that right what's me next what's my next you know in endorphin kick oh it's monkey riding a pig yeah i'll watch, I'll watch you pretender. know Gender, I'll watch so. that. I won't even give the channel a like or leave a nice comment. No, because I'm, you know, and we can all learn from you, Nick, you know, and we can all do a lot better and we can. Um... I, I'm only human. I, I don't confess to have ever had been the greatest, best human being there ever well, was. Ro Royal Marines are just human. But I, am, I am now working on being a better version. And yeah, hopefully, like as you say, the forwards together, I say, uh, I keep saying forwards together to people because. We're all in this together, aren't we? So. We are, mate. We are. We are. Nick, much, much love to you and yours. I can't wait to our next chat. All the best with the book. Link below, folks. Massive love to you all, too. If you can like and subscribe, we'd really appreciate it. Click the notification bell. Ooh. And uh, and uh, I can't we'll wait to see you again bye. soon. <laughs> right. All the best with the M MDS, mate. Yes. Until aired by then but take care all right good nick go steady i'm gonna go out of this because i'm straight into another one but uh thank you ever so much mate take care mate bye -bye. cheers cheers